Um, so good afternoon, everybody. I hope you're all doing well and you're enjoying nice sunny weather like we are in, in Belgium for once. Um, I would like to welcome you all to this EPC event on Georgia-NATO relations, which will look at progress Georgia has made since the Bucharest summit in 2008, uh, when the country was promised a seat at NATO's table, although there was no timeline attached to this. So Georgia and NATO have been engaged now um, for a very long time, 13 years. NATO has been central to the transformation of the Georgian armed forces, strengthening Georgia's military capability, including advancing its territorial defenses and boosting security sector reform. In return, I have to say that Georgia seems to have been like a wonderful partner. It has done everything uh, that NATO has asked from it, including meeting, meeting NATO's defense spending target, which as we know, uh, many of the allies don't, don't do. Uh, and Georgia has done more. I would say that actually Georgia has bent over backwards in its efforts to receive the much coveted membership action plan, otherwise known as a map. Um, but to no avail, NATO still won't commit to marriage. Uh, this has raised the question marks over the alliance's open door policy and whether NATO actually made Georgia an empty promise back in 2008. So we're gonna be taking stock of the situation today and looking at the obstacles in Georgia's path, including of course the big elephant in the room, um, namely the Russians and how these obstacles can be overcome as well as looking at what Georgia can expect from the forthcoming NATO summit. We also want to take a look at security issues in the broader region because all of these things are connected, including the Black Sea security dynamics and the impact of Russia's growing influence there uh, and the implications of the new geopolitical situation in the South Caucasus following last year's Nagorno-Karabakh war. I'm really happy that we have three excellent speakers with us today. Um, first of all, we have Leila Chikovani, uh, who is de first Deputy Minister of Defence of Georgia. We have James Apatarai, Deputy Assistant Secretary General for Political Affairs and Security Policy, uh, and NATO Secretary General Special Representative for, this, for the South Caucasus. Uh, and last but certainly not least, um, we have Matt Breiser, who is a senior fellow at the Atlantic Council and is also former US Deputy Assistant Secretary General. Um, so welcome uh, to all of you guys. Um, to the audience, uh, you can put your questions either by clicking on the hand icon or by typing it into the chat box. I would be grateful if you could put your questions sort of early on so that I can include them in the discussion um, as we go along. Um, but without further ado, I would like to open uh, this discussion uh, and I would like to start with the, the Deputy Minister. Um, so I'd like to start by asking you if you can give us um, an update um, on the current situation in Georgia, um, Georgia, I was going to say Georgia EU, Georgia NATO relations. Um, what's been uh, going on and what are your expectations um, for the forthcoming uh, NATO summit? The floor is yours. Thank you, Amanda. Thank you very much. And first of all, thank you for uh, those discussions. And it says prior the uh, June NATO summit, which just makes it even more important. And I'm um, just honored and pleased to be part of this distinguished audience. Uh, absolutely honored to see James and Matthew. Um, and uh, we're going, I, I do anticipate good discussion today and uh, having opportunity to give you the perspectives of my country towards NATO integration with a great pleasure. So as you rightly mentioned, since Bucharest summit, we are very much eager to um, achieve the membership and to just get a uh, full member of the NATO. However, I have to state here on behalf of government of my country and certainly Minister of Defense that we are pursuing strategic patience on that path. And uh, when I'm talking about the strategic patience, certainly it goes along with the strategic readiness. The strategic readiness for ourselves, it's to get prepared for the NATO membership, to achieve NATO interoperability, 
to do the homework rightly, to just embrace all standards that those are required. And whenever NATO is ready to embrace Georgia, we are instantly going to be ready to get uh, into and to become the immediately the um, great members of the alliance. This is attitude. Um, we are taking it very seriously, considering the fact that over 75%, and this is a constant number, nation of mine, the people of Georgia are um, voting for NATO membership, despite the uh, uh, extremely challenging security situation within the region and around the country. If we are just uh, taking into account the 20% uh, occupied daily ongoing borderization process, violation of the human rights in the occupied territories, kidnapping, and uh, also right now after the Nagorno-Karabakh, the uh, Russian military buildups increased. And after the Crimea annexation, even more. So we do uh, see around country within Black Sea region, more than 100,000 Russian troops. Despite that fact, the um, um, desire and also the strategic mission and the strategic goal of the government of the country, which is stated within the supreme document of my country, which is constitution, and also supported by the population, we are dedicatedly moving towards NATO integration. And uh, we are very much committed to spend 2% of GDP on defense spending and uh, uh, around 20% on major system acquisition and uh, definitely participating and I think responsibly and um, greatly within the safety for the safety and the security of whole world, meaning we are active in the RSM uh, mission and have uh, being the uh, per capita the biggest contributor to, to the RSM mission. Uh, right now, we're just following the uh, strategy, uh, uh, be together in and get out together. So definitely we're withdrawing our forces and um, in summer period, but if we're just talking about the preparedness, the main thing I have to highlight is that for now, we already proved to the Alliance and to our partners that we are reforming and transforming defense forces of Georgia um, according to the NATO standards. And right now, ongoing processes of GDRP, Georgian Defense Readiness Program, which is very much focused on territorial defense. The territorial defense of Georgia in parallel with the comprehensive approach of my country with regard to total defense, which just uh, absolutely demands the whole of government approach and very strong interagency cooperation this is uh, seriously taken into the consideration and uh, we are working hard on that. And uh, with regard to territorial defense, it is based on NATO's deterrence and the defense policy and uh, also participating at the RSM mission with the, uh, with the NATO troops together and the partners. This all just gave us already on ground more than 30,000 trained troops. We do have the uh, NATO interoperable, well-trained, based on NATO standards, troops ready to be committed towards NATO's um, uh, mission and the tasks and to uh, fight and work together with the alliance uh, countries as well as uh, partners. So when I'm just talking about the preparedness though, also I have to uh, mention that all practical mechanisms granted to Georgia are already uh, very kind of accurately um, implemented. Um, 
it's, it is uh, ANP or SNGP or NATO Georgia Commission or the PARP or you name it. So you know that Ministry of Defense is a, uh, um, quite a fine year and uh, great um, implementer, uh, um, uh, very kind of you know, great player uh, from Georgian government with regard to uh, homework doing. So we are already having the uh, great results um, with regard to SNGP implementation. It just recently updated. We're having 16 initiatives into that and uh, how we're approaching things. It is not only NATO related practical mechanism for us, but if the main strategic goal for Georgia and for Defense Forces of Georgia, Ministry of Defense is to achieve NATO interoperability, to just uh, have the uh, NATO standard development. So therefore we are synchronized our efforts. We are very much harmonizing the NATO-Georgia relationship bilateral with the NATO countries relationship as well as EU-Georgia relationship, making it target oriented, making it very much result oriented and all together we're saving our resources, the human and the financial, but gaining even more out of it with that serious and absolutely one more time, target-oriented approach. So um, for now, I have to mention that I guess it is already time to revise the uh, uh, policies and the strategies of uh, um, NATO countries. And uh, it is already time to have Georgia in because it's not only that Georgia needs to be the member of the NATO, but we think that NATO needs Georgia as well. We can give you more than somebody can think because having the uh, experience and having accumulated knowledge of the region, also experience the conventional war with Russia, also, just uh, experiencing hybrid warfare ongoing until today. And um, having those lessons learned in here, absolute understanding of the region, having brilliant intel, which we are daily base sharing with, uh, with uh, NATO. The commitment from us is that being very responsible partner, reliable partner for NATO. We are committed to make NATO stronger. And with the, us being in, we can make it even um, in more beneficial way. So this is just briefly, just as an introduction, and uh, definitely I will continue with my elaboration more lately. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank Deputy Minister, for this um, great um, overview. Um, I would like to come back afterwards with a few questions, but I want to move straight to um, um, to James to um, to basically follow up a bit um, on what you have what you have said, um, because I'd like to hear um, your take, James. I mean, you've been working on the South Caucasus on on Georgia um, for many years, so you know this dossier. Um, very well. So maybe you can give us your perspective on where you think things um, stand today um, and also sort of better understand how come Georgia hasn't yet received um, a map? I mean, will Georgia ever receive one? Um, what more does Georgia actually need uh, to do? And what can we look forward to at, at the NATO summit? Will something at the NATO summit be delivered to Tbilisi? So thanks for all those questions and thanks for the invitation. And let me say, I really agreed with a lot of what Layla had to say. We've been working together for many years, so I guess that's not a big surprise. Um, and so she probably won't be surprised with much of what I say, but hopefully it can be of interest to, to the rest of, of the audience. Uh, I'd say the first thing is uh, that the way you framed it, engagement, is, uh, is a pretty nice way of framing it. Uh, I mean, Georgia's not yet you know, fully taken the, the vows to join the alliance, but Georgia's also not alone. Uh, and that's a big difference from, there's a big difference between engaged and alone. Uh, and Georgia isn't alone. Um, there's a, 
famous old quote that marriage has many pains, but celibacy has no pleasures and being all by yourself uh, isn't that great. Uh, and Georgia isn't alone. Uh, there's a lot of Georgia in NATO, but there's a lot of NATO in Georgia. And I'll come back to that uh, in a moment. The, the main point I, I think is to state that NATO is as committed as ever to the Bucharest decisions. And you'll see um, if you choose to read our communique that there will be, I think, very clear language in there that NATO is committed to the open door. And we can prove that we're committed to the open door because we've just taken in North Macedonia and just before that we took in Montenegro. And I can tell you in both cases, uh, if we're talking about the elephant in the room, as you put it, the Russians didn't like it. In both cases, the Russians tried to stop it, uh, including with some rather um, uh, rough tactics. Uh, but we did it anyway. You'll also see in the communique clear language about Georgia and, and that we still stand by uh, the commitment made in 2008. And for those who've been involved in drafting this kind of thing, and Matthew has, you can easily just say nothing at all. If you don't mean it anymore, you just stop saying it. You don't have to say you don't believe it anymore. You just don't say it anymore. But we do. Uh, and we continue to repeat it and the Russians continue to not like it. Uh, but we do it because we we stand by it and we still believe in it. And then the next point I would make is we also recognize that Georgians believe in it. And Leila cited the the public uh, polling figures about Georgia's Georgians' support for NATO membership. And I think it's really important to say that because it has been, as you said, quite a few years. And yet, despite everything, despite all the pressure, despite all the disinformation, despite all of the potential disappointment, uh, Georgians have made a civilizational choice. And the civilizational choice is that they are part of the West, that they share our values, which we see every day, and are willing to fight for them. That's a huge thing. And it's not gonna go away one way or the other, depending on the, the speed of uh, map. It is a civilizational choice and we respect that very much and Georgia's, Georgians act on it. And I think that's really very um, important because it, it, it continues to make the case uh, to NATO allies. So I think that that's, um, that's crucial. But when I say Georgians act, let me also note uh, that we are very grateful for the very substantial contribution that Georgia makes to not just NATO operations, but also in support of EU operations. Uh, that is very um, a very strong message that Georgia isn't a consumer of security, it's a contributor to uh, international security. And that's what we're looking for in NATO members uh, as well. So it's not easy, but Georgia really steps up uh, and does it. Uh, and, and we're grateful for that. But then we come to the, the way forward. I, there isn't now, I think consensus for MAP. I think that is just as clear as, um, as Layla said, but it's also true that exactly as she said, Georgia has all the practical tools necessary to prepare for membership and is using those tools. So actually the yardsticks are being moved and I think Georgians can see that they're being moved uh, in the reforms, in the increasing presence of NATO in Georgia, for example, through the Defense Institution Building School, the Joint Training and Education Center, the annual exercises that take place, the high level visits that take place. Um, and uh, now what we are seeing is a growing new track of cooperation, which relates to Black Sea security for reasons which Leila laid out very well. And we have a substantial program of cooperation where we are enhancing information exchange so we can all see what's going on and we're grateful for what Georgia contributes. We're having more uh, naval patrols, more air patrols, more support to Georgia's Coast Guard so that they can defend their coasts uh, better. We're doing the same thing with Ukraine. We have high level political consultations together with Georgia and Ukraine on Black Sea security. So that whole track of work is now growing, unfortunately, because the Russian military presence in the Black Sea is growing, but it does mean that we're ever closer 
uh, together. And we're going to work on being able to exchange information better. So there's really quite a lot going on. But I'd add a third area, which I think will come out of the summit. I think what you'll see out of the summit is a recognition that we are entering in or are in an era of strategic competition. Strategic competition between the democratic world and the autocratic world. And that means defending our physical security. It means defending our values. It means depending, defending the systems and norms that our values depend on in other international bodies like the UN, like the International Telecommunications Union, like the Human Rights Council. And NATO and the European Union are going to be more active in working with our partners who share our values, who are like-minded to defend our system uh, against um, a different set of values uh, that we don't share. And that doesn't mean just physically, but it means very much acting together uh, to defend them. And Georgia is very much part of that community, including as one of our enhanced operations partners. So I think we will see uh, enhanced opportunity partners. So I think we will see more political consultation as well coming out of the summit with Georgia really first in line uh, to, um, to be part of, of all of that. So I'll, I'll say two things to end. One is, I have, as you noted, been, been working with Georgia for over a decade now, and that won't last forever, but the transition between Georgia 10 years ago and Georgia now is remarkable. And the defense field, first of all, I mean, when I look at uh, Georgian soldiers that have cycled through our operations in Afghanistan, they're like Canadian soldiers, well-trained, uh, well-equipped, experienced, professional, interoperable, uh, like first class. That wasn't the case a decade and a half ago. Uh, so you can really see the improvements there. But overall, Georgian society has reformed the political system, the legal system, the intelligence structure, but we're not there yet. I think Georgians would be the first to say that there's a lot of reform that still needs to happen. We will help that to happen uh, with our offices, um, et cetera. So I, I think we shouldn't say the road has been run and it's just for NATO to, to come to a political decision. Uh, Layla is absolutely right in her strategy. It's what we advise as well. Clear away the obstacles, make the reforms necessary. And when the politics are right, then Georgia will be ready and can walk through the door. So I think MAP is the membership action plan. It's a, it's a step. But I think sometimes it's a little bit of a red herring. It's a political step that will recognize that we are close to membership uh, in and of itself. Uh, but in the interim, there's a lot we can do. We have the tools to do it. Georgia is doing it and we will uh, continue to support it. So thank you very much. Thank you, James. I would just like to stay for one second on this, this map issue, um, because as you rightly said, there's no consensus. Um, but on the other hand, as you also said, the other tools that Georgia has, they've used very well um, to basically meet a lot of the criteria or the issues that are laid down in the map. Um, so is it not the case that it's possible to just trash the map? I mean, put it in the trash can um, and forget about the map because it's become so, you know, politicized. I mean, this was suggested in a recent EPC document, but it's also been, you know, suggested by many others, including my colleague at Heritage, you know, Luke Kofi. I mean, would that not be the way to go um, rather than have it sort of hanging there all the time as something that seems to be almost non-obtainable um, for some of these new aspirant countries? So I'll, I'll be very open and just give you my view. I, I'm not now giving the, the NATO view. I just want to stress that the consensus official website uh, view. First to say a lot of allies are attached to having MAP as the next step. So whatever the logic is, um, from some perspectives, it is there. And right now and for the foreseeable future, there's no getting around that step. But what I would say is the following. Um, you're quite right that it has acquired a political resonance that 
those of us who worked on developing it uh, never imagined. Uh, we saw it as a practical tool and, you know, with a nice uh, sort of political tinge, but not more than that, but it has become highly politicized, um, which is why, in my view, uh, there are some allies who are hesitant about granting MAP long before granting membership. And the reason they're hesitant is because they believe it has acquired a political resonance linked to membership, which does not give security assurances. And that granting MAP without granting security assurances that come with membership will put Georgia more at risk. And that the time to grant MAP is just before the time to grant membership, because that way the security assurances come along and Georgia then gets the protection of being in NATO. And that in their view, it is wiser to work on reform and on preparing the political ground, and then to grant MAP when membership is really on the immediate agenda, because they feel that doing it a different way, granting MAP early and then waiting puts Georgia at risk. So this is the thinking behind that. Uh, and uh, you know, it's not shared by all allies, it's what some allies think. And it's one of the reasons why MAP is not granted now. So just so you know how we think here. Okay, thank you for the clarification. Um, now I'd like to turn um, to you, Matt, just to um, go back to a couple of things that James said. I mean, he said that Georgia is not alone, um, but if the Russian tanks rolled over the border tomorrow, this is just because I want to be provocative. <laughs> um, I think Georgia would be rather alone, but I mean, please correct me um, if I'm wrong. Uh, and I'd also like to hear your views as well on this open door policy, because I mean, James mentioned, you know, correctly, you know, North Macedonia, um, et cetera. But I still think that there's a difference between North Macedonia uh, and Montenegro when compared to Georgia. I mean, they don't have a border um, with Russia and there's no Russian military base there. So I think there's a clear difference there. So I'm, I'm wondering to what degree, you know, Russia, Russia's presence in the occupied territories, you know, are a sort of uh, part of, you know, NATO's concerns. Um, and the second, but my second question is more related to the position of, of the United States. I mean, back in the day in 2008, I mean, George Bush, you know, he was a flame carrier um, for Georgia. He was the one that pushed for Georgia to get the um, membership uh, perspective. But how do you see that US policy has evolved um, over the last few years because I mean from my point of view I don't see that any of the other presidents that have followed um, Bush have been so enthusiastic um, so maybe you could comment on that uh, particularly vis-a-vis -vis the Biden presidency because clearly a, a strong push for from Joe Biden going into the to the NATO summit for Georgia if he stands behind Georgia and says yes yes we need to keep our commitments to Georgia and pushes some of the other countries that are a bit skeptical particularly France and Germany um, could have a positive impact um, so what's what's your view on this? Sure, thanks. Let, let me start with uh, George W. Bush in Bucharest because I was there with him. And um, you know, at that time I was the Georgia guy uh, at the State Department uh, and some other countries as well. And he gave a speech uh, the afternoon of the famous dinner. Uh, and I just by chance happened to be just luckily sitting, sitting near Mrs. Bush. So he came over to uh, talk to her after the speech. And then he grabbed my arm and he said, tonight at the dinner, I'm gonna fight like crazy to get Georgia map. But I'm pessimistic um, because there's some serious opposition. In fact, it was one of the two countries you just mentioned. <laughs> Amanda, I won't say which one. Uh, and in the end, it was that leader uh, who, who blocked uh, granting a map for Georgia instead came up, came up with that uh, kind of tortured uh, formulation. Thank goodness though, as James stated, NATO standing by it, good, which is that Georgia and Ukraine will become uh, members of NATO eventually, essentially, uh, when, when they've completed their reform process, more or less. I mean, I butchered it. Um, and, and immediately, I, I started sweating when I heard that because <laughs> I realized this was, this was like red meat for Vladimir Putin, right? This was NATO saying, um, Georgia's coming in, uh, 
not quite yet. So essentially, you better act now if you're going to do something. I mean, obviously, that wasn't the intention, but that's how that's how uh, Putin and Russia uh, interpreted it, the whole situation. And I remember the next morning, my boss at the time uh, directing me to call the Georgian foreign minister at the time and sell sell this uh, this outcome to 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 uh, her. And uh, I failed, of course. <laughs> um, so I, I really believe that had MAP been granted, uh, we would have seen a totally different dynamic. And it's unlikely, it's much less likely that Russia would have invaded uh, and occupied 20 plus percent of Georgia. And had Russia not done that, I don't think we would have seen Russia ever invading uh, Ukraine, uh, occupying essentially Donbas and annexing uh, Crimea. And I, yeah, I would uh, just use Nicolas Sarkozy's own words at the time. In August, I think it was August 18th or 19th of, of 2008, he, uh, he wrote an op-ed in the Washington Post and he said, well, what just happened is unconscionable, what, what Russia did in invading uh, Georgia. Uh, and if they ever do that to Ukraine, so he realized Ukraine was on the horizon as well, uh, th essentially then we're gonna be really upset and we'll, and we'll take uh, severe countermeasures. So, okay, Georgia, Russia gets a pass more or less, but don't touch Ukraine. So I think that had there been map at that time, we would see a much different situation, uh, would have seen a different situation. And I, but I, I agree with you that, you know, the, the primary reason why NATO hasn't granted map, it's not NATO itself. When you listen to James, I mean, you can, you can tell and knowing him all these years, I mean, <laughs> he wants Georgia to get in, even if he can't say it. And so does virtually everybody at NATO, maybe with the exception of staffers from those two countries we were talking about. But it's, it's the political decision of the member states. The sovereigns are the ones who, who will make the decision. And, you know, what I found maddening during my time, essentially being one of the U.S. cheerleaders for, for Georgia to get map, was the pretext that um, there are separatist movements. Uh, and this was, you know, even before Russia invaded. So, so you know, NATO does, shouldn't include, it shouldn't incorporate uh, a new member uh, if there's a separatist conflict on their territory. But, you know, what about Spain? What about Quebec and Canada? I mean, James, granted, it's not nearly as <laughs> serious a separatist movement as in Abkhazia. Uh, what about Germany? Germany entered NATO when it was a divided country, when there were two Germanies. So if the geography and the politics dictate that it's in the member states' interests, urgent interest to see one of these countries or two of these countries come in, then it'll happen. And MAP is just, it's, it's, it's irrelevant at this point, because just as James was saying, um, everybody knows that George is you know, ready, uh, more or less. Uh, Georgia, I mean, the Georgian troops who fought with, with NATO in uh, Afghanistan, as Deputy Minister said, uh, that was the largest per capita contribution uh, of any country in terms of that peacekeeping operation. And I remember from my days in government, uh, my military colleagues were really impressed by how well the Georgians fought, how brave they are and were, uh, and, and how professional they, they, they were and are. Um, so, you know, as soon as there's a political decision to, to, to grant MAP, it means that France and Germany, especially Germany, have decided no longer to oppose Georgia's membership in principle. And so, by and large, MAP really doesn't matter in the end. Um, Georgia is alone. Of course it's alone. I mean, there's, there, with no Article 5, there's, there's no chance that U.S. troops or NATO troops would intervene on Georgia's side uh, if Russia were to push further and, and resume military operations. And Moscow knows that. That's exactly why we see this continue uh, borderization, even though it's a boundary, it's not a border, even though you, you, you see this increasing Russian troop presence, well, in the, in the neighborhood, in, in the Black Sea, and there's lots to say about Black Sea security and Turkey, by the way, which maybe we'll get to uh, later on. But of course, Georgia's on its own, and that was proven when Russia invaded Georgia. Um, something I've, I've never really talked about publicly, but um, there was a discussion at a high level in Washington about, well, should we do something, something militarily? Uh, and of course, nothing kinetic uh, ever happened. But, you know, we did send uh, C-17 loaded with humanitarian aid to Tbilisi in the middle of the military operations. Uh, I, I was the guy who greeted it at the airport. And I, I remember saying on the conference call with our secretaries of defense and state and national security advisor, I said, uh, dear bosses, um, it's, it's there's a certain probability or there's some chance that Russia will bomb the airfield like they did a few days ago when that C-17 is on the ground because they threatened to do so. And my boss said, yeah. <laughs> and they chuckled and they said, but you're going to that airport. So we, that was, you know, quite a demonstrative step. We also flew back, I guess, a couple of battalions of, of uh, Georgian troops that were serving at the time in Iraq, got them back on the ground in Georgia. Uh, so as James said, it's, it's, it's not that Georgia is 
alone in a celibate sense. Uh, it has strong political backing that sometimes is action, uh, but it's not the kinetic action, the Article 5 action uh, that Georgia seeks uh, and, and eventually uh, will merit, will deserve. Um, yeah, I'll stop there. I'll stop there. Thank you, Matt. Um I'd like to return to you now, um, De Deputy Minister, because you said at the beginning that support for in Georgia for NATO membership is still very high, um, 70 something percent. Um, do you think there's a risk of this waning um, if more and more years go by um, without you know, an end result? Um, and the second, my second question would be, um, I think some member states of NATO, um, not to name them, of course, are under the have the opinion that bringing um, Georgia in would be more of a would be a more of a security problem um, than a benefit. Um, so, do you think that Georgia? I mean, Georgia should do more to convince some of these countries. I mean, what more could Georgia do um, to convince some of the skeptical countries that Georgia won't be a burden to the alliance? Uh, and is Georgia already doing these things, or, or what more could they actually do, or are planning to do? If that makes sense. Thank you. Uh, thank you for all great um, ideas and thoughts. And um, I would tend to think that Georgia is not alone, having uh, great friends and the strategic partners around. And um, as Matt, uh, just representing the US and the US-Georgia strategic partners partnership, never ever being that high level and that steady and that absolutely efficient as it is right now, or NATO-Georgia partnership and the James is representing the NATO, however, representing its own country as well. And uh, I cannot say that we are alone. We are um, surrounded by our partners and this is a uh, steadfast steadfast policy of ours as well to have more NATO and the more US in Georgia, to embrace our partners and having our friends around. And by that, just develop the country towards NATO membership, just prepare the country with regard of the NATO standards and also building up very solid and very grounded democratic institutions to create resiliency within the country to just work uh, just towards not only readiness as we are just you know having that policy on territorial defense the readiness level high and so on and so on, but also to build up resilient country including resilient society and resiliency of society definitely is assisted and supported by very much structured, very much solid democratic institutions. And by that, Amanda, if I'm just answering your country, uh, about, uh, your uh, question about the 75% um, polls, it's never going to be down. I do not anticipate that because as James mentioned, it is a matter of choice. Georgian nation and Georgian government already made that existential and quite a civilizational choice. We are seeing ourselves as a part of Euro-Atlantic community. We do ourselves as a part of democratic world and we have chosen democracy over autocracy and dictatorship this is very strong irreversible choice and this is absolutely reversible uh, part of country of mine and people of mine and uh, when we are just talking how we have to be responsible supporting societies and the populations choice and their desire definitely work hard work dedicatedly with our partners together with our allied partners uh, together towards towards that euro-atlantic path toward that integration itself and uh, when we're just talking what georgia can just do for that as well for the wider audience you all just know that but uh, I talked about the preparedness of my country 
with regard of readiness, with regard of interoperability. And you all mentioned that this is purely political uh, decision to grant Georgia with a membership. I'm not even talking about the map because I do agree with all whatever you are saying. We do need to get in and uh, as uh, uh, soon as possible, meaning without any kind of delay, without any kind of, as Matt says, the uh, red meat. And uh, uh, Amanda, your article, wonderful. And you are mentioning just despite all of that things, you know, that the defense forces are ready. You're saying in addition to upholding NATO standards, national trends reveal that Georgia is catching up with the current NATO members in international ratings that assess the level of media freedom, the rule of law, and the business environment, Transparency International's Corruption Perception Index ranks Georgia 45th while members Montenegro and North Macedonia are 67th and 111th respectively. Nothing against those countries. However, I love that uh, from your article. And also, I have to just um, tell you one uh, more thing. Georgia, situated at the crossroads of European and Asian powers, and its important geostrategic location provides valuable venues for trade, commerce and energy through sea and overland roads for eight landlocked countries with a market size close to a billion consumers. So in add to that readiness of my country already with regard of interoperability, NATO standard democracy level, add to that responsibility and reliability of my country. And I guess whoever wants to be positive about that can just easily see how ready Georgia is for NATO membership and how valuable my country, my nation is for the NATO alliance. Thank you, Minister, and thank you for the for the compliment on the on the article. Um, I have a few questions that have that have come in um, now that I would like to to put across to. Uh, um, you guys. Um, the first one is from Andrew Duff, who's a former member of the European Parliament, and he's asking, surely Georgia would be more secure as a neutral buffer state under NATO protection than a frontline NATO member state. Um, then we have two questions from Alex at Petashvili. Um, and the first one is to you, um, James, and he's asking, why, was, why were Georgia and Ukraine not invited to the NATO summit? Um, and the second question is to all of you, and he's asking, um, the, ele the elephant um, will, uh, will unfortunately not go away and it will always object to Georgia's membership. Um, why don't we start discussing the so-called Rasmussen formula or Lukofi's formula, um, what, whichever way you want to call it. Um, so maybe I'll give the floor to you first, um, James. Sure, uh, just with those little questions. Um, First, uh, to answer the first question from, from the former parliamentarian, um, unfortunately, there's no such thing as a neutral buffer state under NATO protection. That doesn't exist. Uh, and I'll give you a very sort of real example, uh, which is Sweden. Uh, we work extremely closely with Sweden and they are you know, quite close to NATO territory, like Georgia is in a different part of the part of the world, but where actually uh, having close cooperation with Sweden really benefits NATO. Uh, so it's really a very uh, two-way two street. We have uh, all kinds of arrangements in place, joint exercises, et cetera, et cetera. But uh, a few years ago under um, Secretary General Rasmussen, he went to Sweden uh, and a journalist asked him, you know, we said to him, you know, we do all these things together. We cooperate, we share values. Uh, we train, etc. Would NATO come to protect us if Russia attacked? And he said in a very Danish way, no. Uh, that was pretty much the totality of his answer, but his point was there's a member and there's a non-member and there's no halfway house, uh, unfortunately. That being said, one of the reasons why we put so much of NATO into Georgia and why allies do, why the US does, why we have these facilities, why we have people there 
why we have exercises together is to make it very clear that even if we don't provide security assurances under Article 5 to non-NATO members, Georgia matters to NATO, and NATO is present in Georgia, and that there is a cost uh, to uh, further hostilities because we're there too. So there's a very clear signal, and we hope a deterrent effect. Georgia is not alone, and we have put skin in the game, as we have said, by putting our people there. Uh, to make it very clear. And I know the U.S. does that very deliberately as well. And we, of course, are part of that whole uh, team. Um, second, why were they not invited to the NATO summit? Well, no non-NATO country was invited to the summit. It's very short. It's like three hours long. We have a lot of NATO business to get through. Uh, and President Biden's schedule, you know, kind of drives a lot of this. And he's coming from the G7. He's going to a meeting with uh, President Putin. Uh, so we had a short window and we just had to get through all the things that we have to get through. And unfortunately no partner could come this time, but we will have another summit next year. And uh, there is clearly a push here to ensure that next year's summit is a much bigger one, more traditional with partners um, in, invited. Um, so I think I've addressed the ones that, that you would wish me to address. Okay, thank you, James. Um, now I'll give the floor again to um, to you, Matt, um, to hear your your replies on, on the couple of questions that were put there. Sure, and, and I, by the way, I didn't respond to your initial question about the Biden administration possibly pushing for, to renew membership action plan for Georgia. I, I don't think there's any policy on that yet in Washington. And you know, this trip that that James was just talking about uh, will will maybe get Georgia back on the map. Uh, as will uh, uh, the, in the meeting with President Putin. Um, but I, I think, to be honest, I mean, the, the shenanigans in Parliament over the course of the last several months uh, set, set things back a little bit, I think, psychologically for a lot of people uh, in Washington. The good news is Georgia has gotten through that political crisis uh, thanks to the EU brokering that agreement between the opposition and the government. Uh, and UNM now has, has signed on. So President Sa former President Saakashvili's political party and movement has now not signed on to the agreement, but agrees to take up their mandates in parliament. And I think in hindsight, hopefully we're going to look back and see Maybe this was a, a, a bubble of immaturity in the development of Georgia's democracy, but Georgia's democracy passed the test. Th that's a big deal. Um, the question, yeah, Alex's question about, about the Luke Coffey, uh, Andres Falk Rasmussen uh, plan, I love it because there's a precedent in, in Europe, which is not NATO uh, related, but it's EU related, and that's Cyprus. Um, Cyprus, the entire island of Cyprus acceded to the European Union. Uh, it's just that the, the body of law, the acquis communautaire, the body of EU law, is suspended in northern Cyprus, w whatever that means. I mean, it's sort of an obscure formulation. So that worked for the EU, um, and it, it, in theory, it should work with NATO as well, except for the elephant, <laughs> which is you know, Russia does a great job in frightening some uh, member states uh, and suggesting that there could be renewed warfare, uh, always putting the blame on Georgia as being the provocateur. And, and you know, in the days of, of President Saakashvili, I mean, he was such a colorful, charismatic figure that it was easy to blame him for being provocative when in fact he was reacting. Um, I, I recall back in June of 2004, so already over four years, four years before uh, the invasion, um, Russia was moving armor uh, into South Ossetian villages, concealing that armor and forests, et cetera. Uh, but nobody wanted to listen. Nobody listened to Saakashvili and company, or they didn't want to because it was such an inconvenient truth that perhaps Russia really was uh, breaking the international agreements to which it had signed up and was maybe preparing for, for a conflict. So I think in perpetuity, Russia is going to continue to use that lever of fear, not fear against the Georgian people, but fear in Europe about another conflict maybe uh, being provoked by Georgia, even if Georgia is doing nothing to provoke. Therefore, uh, it seems to me logically, the only solution, as long as we can see into the future, the only one is that all of Georgia will be uh, accepted theoretically into NATO, but operationally only the, if we call it the, the area that, that's controlled still by the Georgian government will operationally be part of it. But we will all then uh, maintain that, of course, all, all of Georgia legally is, is part of uh, NATO, just these two regions are occupied by Russia. Thanks. Mm. Amanda, if I may. 
Yeah, um, yes, you may, but I just want to put an additional question to you as well that came through um, from Dmitro Chikuro, who's from Ukrainian Youth uh, Press. Um, and he's asking whether the fact that Georgia's application is frequently linked to Ukraine's um, is seen as an obstacle. I mean, would it be better to really break them into, if I can put it that way, you know, stop speaking about Ukraine and Georgia in the same sentence. I mean, is it is it a hindrance or or not? I mean, how do you see this this in Georgia? Thank you. Yeah. So um, just answering the um, uh, first question, though, um, I do agree with my uh, dear friends with their elaboration. However, however, I need to state here that um, yes, we're not uh, alone and we are just uh, with our friends and with our partners together in that working together and fighting together part. Uh, but mostly this is a responsibility of uh, country of mine and the government of mine to deter the threat and defend the country. And there is a realization of that and there is absolute understanding of that strategically um, very much um, challenging mission, considering Russia's factor and Russia's revisionist policy and politics of Kremlin. However, I have to mention that during the nine years of administration of the Georgian dream, we are having this stability within the country, stability and no war at all. If my friends are going to agree with that, none of the presidents before just achieved that kind of stability. Every single presidency, we suffered with the war. It was conventional or it was civil. Nine years of now, because of very pragmatic and very much rational approach, seeing who are friends and who is or are enemies, who are the adversaries, how to deal with that very peculiar and if not saying even more uh, situation, we just uh, remain stable politically and economically. We are having country despite all challenges and the threats coming from northern neighbor of ours, Russia, still demanding from democratic and Euro-Atlantic world to be part of their family because we belong to that family. And um, this is how we are continue to, to walk. The whole policy and the whole strategy of Prime Minister Garibashvili is about NATO and European integration. And whole government is working dedicatedly toward those two main strategic missions. And if we're just talking about Russia and Russia just creating the obstacles, again, back to your article, Amanda, if I may, you are just uh, rightly mentioned in your article. NATO must follow uh, and demonstrate the genuine open door policy. There should be no Russian doorman deciding who enters the NATO club. By reaffirming Georgia's eventual membership, NATO will send a strong signal to the region that difficult reforms to pay off and simultaneously strengthen its credibility vis-a-vis -vis Kremlin. I couldn't agree more. Mm -hmm. And now with regard to Ukraine, <laughs> statement here is that Georgia supports Ukraine's sovereignty and territorial integrity. Georgia is very much steadfast in its policy and strategy to assist Ukraine in every single possible way, just supporting their dedication and their desire and again, strategic mission to be integrated into Euro-Atlantic community. We are backing them we are remaining to be next to them and uh, absolutely sharing with them experience that we accumulated already during that almost two decades working towards NATO integration path and uh, wishing them to achieve their bright future. Thank you very much, uh, Minister. Uh
I would like now to give actually the floor to my colleague, um, Jana Mazaradze, um, who has a question. So if my colleagues can um, unmute uh, Jana, that would be great. Thank you, Amanda. Uh, thank you to the distinguished uh, speakers for their remarks. Uh, I would like to address my question to both Mr. Apathurai and uh, Ambassador Bryza, if I may. In NATO's uh, strategic concept from 2010, Russia was mentioned and perceived as a partner. This was right between the August war in 2008 in Georgia and events in Ukraine in 2014. Um, and my question refers back to both of your remarks actually. Uh, could the events in Ukraine be avoided if NATO had a stronger stance on Russia back then? And uh, how will um, NATO describe Russia in the upcoming NATO summit um, now? And what will be the messages towards Russia? In process of preparation for um, 2030, should we expect the transatlantic alliance to further change its strategy towards Russia to avoid continuous hostile actions? Thanks. Thank you, Jana. And um, we have a, a question or a, or a clarification here from Paul Taylor for something that you said, Matt. Um, and he's asking you if you meant that Georgia could join NATO with Russian troops on its territory. And if so, would that commit NATO to any hostilities with Russia to remove those forces or not necessarily? So if you could just clarify what you meant the first time around, that would be great. Um, so maybe I'll give you the floor first, Matt, then we'll come to um, come to James and then back to you, Minister. Sure, no, that, that is uh, a question I, I don't know the answer to, but it's the same situation with Cyprus. There are Turkish troops uh, on the ground in Northern Cyprus, 35,000 of them. Uh, and nonetheless, all of Cyprus is ceded to, to the EU, inclu including the territory where those troops are. Again, it's just that the body of law uh, of the European Union is suspended. Um, and so that, that leads into Iana's question. Um, I, I, I sort of already hinted at, at my answer or stated it. I, I believe, of course, that if the United States had been, I mean, if NATO had been more demonstratively uh, resisting uh, Russian military adventurism, I, I don't think, I think the chance of Russia invading Ukraine would be much, much less. In fact, I was saying, I believe that had uh, Georgia been granted a, a map back at Bucharest, I, I think there, there's a strong possibility that uh, Russia would not have invaded Georgia either. Um, and I say that not out of some sort of polemical or ideological perspective. I just, while I was in the US government at the time, I saw how Russian behavior became much more aggressive right after Bucharest. Uh, and so um, it, it seemed to me like there was, there was definitely a relation between the two Happenings, and it, even even in my own discussions with, let's say, then deputy with the foreign minister of, of Russia, I, don't, I won't say the name, as well as a, a deputy chief of general staff in Moscow, um, their attitudes really changed after Bucharest, and we got to a point where we were having urgent, very high level consultations as the tension was heating up in Georgia, and it got to July. And suddenly, the deputy foreign minister said, "We're we're just we're all going to be on vacation for the next couple of weeks. Uh, you you won't be able to reach us." And we could not have any discussions. They were Bucharest was the the light switch when it went on. They began to prepare more heavily for war. Thanks. Uh, I guess it's my turn. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sorry, I forgot to so, unmute myself. That, yeah. It's Thanks. Um, a couple of things on um, on Russia and its aggressive actions. I, I'd say one thing. I was in Munich at the security conference in 2007, I think it was, when um, Putin gave a speech, which, you know, I, there haven't been many moments in my life where I thought, oh, now something's happening right in real time. And But that was one of those times. Mm -hmm. And he already laid out before Bucharest a very different approach that Russia was going to take to foreign policy, much more aggressive, anti-Western, anti-democratic. So I'm afraid that actually the seeds for all of this were laid before Bucharest. Um, that, that speech was a real turning point, not because of the speech itself, but because it opened the door to what what Russia was thinking. And you know, when I was in school, they used to teach me that understanding Russia was like a, a puzzle wrapped in a riddle, wrapped in an enigma. But that's not my experience with Russia. Uh, in fact, 
my experience is they tell you what they're going to do. They tell you 10 times, then they put it into law, they practice it, then they do it and we're shocked uh, <laughs> because we just can't believe they would. But then they say, yeah, but we told you, we told you a hundred times. Uh, so I think we were told in 2007 that this was coming. Um, but, and then that, that sticking with Russia and the question that was put to, to me, uh, you know, when I started in this job uh, about 10 years ago, we had really good cooperation with Russia. We had programs of cooperation across Central Asia. We had operational cooperation. We had technology projects together and monthly political consultation. All of it is gone. Uh, and you will see in the communique, which is being negotiated right now, so I don't know what language they'll settle on, but you'll certainly see the word threat and you will not see the word partner. Uh, so, you know, we have fundamentally come to understand that Russia does not want right now partnership with NATO. Uh, we've offered dialogue repeatedly. It hasn't even accepted that, but we're working on, on having it. Uh, so, you know, NATO has undergone a fundamental transformation uh, since 2014 in particular. The biggest military improvement since the Cold War, political engagement with partners, which is very much related to Russia. We have our eyes wide open like everybody else. Uh, and I'm quite sure the strategic concept will reflect that. We want better relations with Russia, but the only way that can happen is if Russia is willing to abide by its international commitments, by international law, to leave its neighbors alone, uh, and engage in good faith. We don't see that now. So we have to beef up our defenses, reach out to our like-minded democratic partners like Georgia, keep the door open to NATO membership. Uh, and when Russia is ready to come to the table um, in good faith, our door to that table is absolutely open as well. Thank you, James. Um, I know we've run out of time, but I want to give the last word to um, to the minister. Um, it's sadly, Georgia won't be at the NATO summit, um, but I'd like to ask you, if you were there, what would be the main message that you would put across? <laughs> yeah. So James mentioned that they've been told so. By Georgia, by Ukrainians, that 2008 war is happening and then Ukraine gonna suffer as well because Ukraine gonna be next. I don't want to, uh, to kind of, you know, pretend to be, we said so, but we told so. And now we are saying that it's time for that open door being definitely opened. Opened in Georgia's desire and strategic goal already being embraced and achieved. There is a time for Georgia being granted by the NATO membership. And, uh, um, but before that, again, you know, not being very much rhetorical on that and not really demanding, I do not want to sound that way because this is not a policy of country of mind and the government of mind. Again, strategic patience and strategic readiness we are walking on that path with you all together, NATO countries and the partners of the NATO. Together, we are just uh, overcoming all challenges and definitely we are achieving that strategic mission. And uh, before that, we are advocating and saluting the policy more NATO in Georgia. And because of that, almost the two decades of development on uh, NATO standards, we achieved a certain stage, quite a NATO standard stage with regard of institutional and the training capability and capacity building that right now we are offering to the NATO countries to have their troops in Georgia for their training capability enhancement, for their readiness level increase, to use the Georgia NATO standard facilities and sending the troops on rotational base for the further training to Georgia. 
And one more, the last remark, it is as in one of the famous song is that, I know that you all like Georgia and you are praising Georgia for the achievements, for the success. And if you like it, then you should put a ring on it. <laughs> President Beyonce. Thank you. I think that was, that was the perfect closing remark. And I totally agree with you. Let's get the ring on, on the finger. Um, I'm actually very sad we have to finish this discussion because I'm having a, a great time out. And I think we could have much longer on many issues we haven't touched on. We haven't touched on Black Sea security enhancement or Turkey. Um, but unfortunately, we need, to, we need to go. I've already taken up enough of all of your valuable time. Um, so I'd like to thank all of you so much for coming uh, and joining us today, for sharing your insights. Uh, to you, Minister, to James, and to Matt, of course. Um, it's always a pleasure to have you here. It's always a pleasure to talk about Georgia. Uh, and I look forward to having future discussions um, in the future. And um, just uh, to flag up, tomorrow the EPC will have a new publication on Black Sea security. Um, so please do check that out. Um, so once again, many thanks. Um, good luck for the NATO summit. Good luck for you, Georgia. And um, until the next time. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.